uh, in teaching the faith. Okay, <clears throat> so let me cut to the chase and explain how this talk came about. Early last fall, I was uh, thinking about what I might do as a devotional act in preparation for All Saints Day. Uh, the idea of preparing for religious feast uh, is uh, commonplace in the church, and we do this all the time. We do it with Advent, prepares us for Christmas, and Lent prepares us for Easter. But individually, uh, one might do, uh, with, do it through special prayers or novenas or fasting. Or in the case of me, I paint in watercolors. And so the idea came that in an attempt uh, to prepare myself for uh, All Saints Day, uh, I might uh, choose to uh, do some paintings, and I selected... Uh, uh, three saints to do. I wanted to do those that were, some that were canonized within my lifetime, and so those were three that I suggested. So the question comes up, how does creating a piece of art prepare one for more fittingly celebrate a feast? And that's not an unreasonable uh, question. Uh, firstly, it provides the artist uh, his own religious education. Unlike uh, painting a tree, painting an individual, or painting a, uh, trying to capture the essence of a religious event, one must know the intricacies and the story, which means that it requires research. That can either be reading the Bible, or the lives of the saints, or even seeing what other artists have done and try to adapt your work uh, to theirs by their inspiration. Secondly, the research and certainly the act of painting moves the artist spiritually and acts as a devotional good work, just the way uh, helping out at a food pantry uh, helps uh, one's uh, uh, life. And thirdly, the love, labor, and difficulties inherent in the act of painting can sacrificially be offered up not only for your own intentions, uh, but also those of uh, souls in purgatory. So there are many ways in which uh, uh, art uh, helps the, uh, uh, the artist, and these were things that I, were think I was thinking about. I also thought that if these paintings came out okay or good, I would offer to them to the school, and if they wanted them, that uh, they could have them. And indeed, they did like them, and they do have them. Uh, and they're in the hall uh, uh, in the school. Okay, uh, could I have the first slide? Can you hear me? Ah, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but this is, as you all know, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and this, th she was one of the saints that I uh, thought to, uh, to do. Uh, next, please. Next. Next slide. Maybe not. Okay, thank you. This was the photograph from which the painting was taken. Uh, I usually uh, will paint from photographs. Painting from uh, nature is uh, very difficult, so it's something that uh, I tend not to do. But for photographs, they stand still, and they don't mind if you get unhappy with them and things like that. Now, let me talk about water uh, technique. Uh, Next, please. Next slide. Okay. This is the watercolor of the next saint, John Paul II. Now, there are a couple of ways of doing watercolors. Uh, I use what they call wet on dry. That means a dry piece of paper, which is sort of porous, and you use the wet is the watercolor. And that's nice uh, because it uh, allows one to have more control 
you can make more intricate uh, figures. Uh, the problem is it dries very quickly, and where you put the, uh, the uh, paint, if it dries and you go to continue the line, there'll be a, a mark between where you ended and where you pick up. So that limits the size of the paintings that uh, one can do. You have to be, be a fast painter, uh, uh, but that limits it. The other technique is called wet on wet. That means where you either spray the paper or you brush it with water so it gets saturated or, or at least wet. And then you do the painting. The advantage there is, since it doesn't dry all at once, you can make a bigger painting. The disadvantage is you can do less intricate things because what happens is when the paint hits the, wa uh, the wet uh, paper, it spreads. So that, well, if it runs into other colors, it gives you very interesting colors, but you, all, you can't always control what, you're going to, what the outcome is going to be. So mine is uh, wet on dry. And that's why the colors don't run too much. It was a little wet on wet in the background. You see the blue in the background? I wet the paper there and then put the blue on. And you see how the color, the blue, is not homogeneous? One color blue, but it runs into each other. Do you see that? OK. Uh, next. And this was the photograph of John Paul, which the painting came from. I changed the color of the vestment and lifted him up a little bit, but that's basically it. Next. This is the painting of uh, Maximilian Kolbe, who's the, uh, called the patron saint of Auschwitz, uh, because uh, he was put in prison for resisting the Nazis. And uh, that's why he's in prison garb. Now, if you uh, notice, he has an inverted triangle on his chest. That means he's a political prisoner. If he were a Jew, he'd have a uh, Star of David in yellow. The number under there is his prison number, and those were also tattooed on the body. Uh, next, that's uh, the photo of uh, Father Colby used uh, for his face. Uh, next, and this is where some research comes in. Uh, this is a prisoner from Auschwitz. I don't know who he is. I got it off the internet. But it l allows you to see that he too is a political prisoner. He has his uh, number there and the striped outfit. And that's where putting the head with the body got me Maximilian Kolbe, because I did want to get his Auschwitz, Auschwitz connection there. OK. Uh, now, basically, how art influenced uh, next, we can go to next how art influences or can be used uh, in uh, religion is the fact that <clears throat> art is beautiful and beauty attracts. And people are mesmerized or directed uh, toward it. And so art can be used and is used to teach, uh, the, uh, to teach the faith. Well, first of all, evangelization basically means to go out and to preach the gospel. And that's usually done with words, and words are good. But as Fra St. Francis Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. So he was implying that there are better ways, or at least other ways, to be able to preach the gospel. And uh, he, I think, was referring to how one lives. If you live well, People see it, and that preaches the gospel. But the same could be said for art. Art can preach the gospel. Now, catechesis, there's evangelization. Catechesis tends to be more limited. It means sort of to be prepared 
for a sacrament or for something specific. So you have catechesis before your confirmation, like a year you'll study, and that's what catechesis is. Okay, now, uh, as I said, art can uh, teach the faithful, and the faithful in those days, in the early days of the church, couldn't read. So uh, a lot of the way we learn about the faith was not open to them because, for two reasons. Uh, one, they couldn't read, and two, there was no printing press. So uh, all books had to be hand-painted, hand-copied, hand-written, which made them limited in number, and nobody had them. You couldn't, you couldn't afford them. Maybe a, a noble would have one or a monastery would have some books, but the garden variety person wouldn't, and he couldn't read them anyway. So how were the faithful taught? Well, they were taught in sermons. They were taught in religious plays. There were a lot of religious plays that were put on so people would learn the faith. They memorized songs. Music was a big influence in teaching them, and they would m memorize lyrics to songs. And then in art, they would use stained glass, sculpture, and painting. <clears throat> but the people had to learn to read the signs and symbols of the painting. Uh, they couldn't read the letters, so when you did a painting, you couldn't put underneath, uh, this is a painting of the Annunciation. They couldn't read it. So the artist had to put signs and symbols into the painting that people would learn. And the way this had to be done was, one, the artist had to consistently use the same symbol to mean the same thing. Not only that, but other artists would have to pick that up and use the same symbol. I mean, it'd be like driving down the street here in Albany, and a red light means stop. Okay? But red light always has to mean stop. Green light always has to mean go. And not only that, but it had to be that way in Albany, in Slingerlands, in Cohoes, or else there'd be chaos, and same with art. So art did require artists and convention to come together and, uh, and do that uh, sort of thing. So these certain symbols are called iconography. The word icon in Greek means a symbol, and you know that. There are symbols on your computer, and that's an icon, okay? Uh, graphy means to write, so it sort of means symbol writing. So when the faithful would see certain symbols, they knew, even though they couldn't read letters, they knew what it meant. Okay, let's look at some of these symbols. Here's the first, oh no, go back. Yeah, this is a painting that was done in uh, 1899, basically 1900, by a French uh, painter, Alphonse Bougereau, and it's the Madonna enthroned. Now, the first symbol that we learn is the halo. The halo, how do you tell in a painting a holy person versus a garden variety person? You put a halo on them. So when we see somebody with a halo, you're trained, you already know this symbol. The other symbol here is the lily. The white lily, by convention, means chastity, purity, virginity. So with the virgin, she has the lily. Remember, this is 1900. We'll look at paintings from 1400 that will have the lily. So by convention, this is what the lily means, and you can't make, you can't change it or else people get confused. You can't make the lily mean a prostitute, okay? You throw them off. Next one. Who's this? St. Joseph. What's he holding in his arm? 
the lily, besides Jesus, the lily, chastity. St. Joseph was her chaste spouse. This is telling the faithful he's, being, he's holding Jesus and he has the lily. This could be Joseph. You can't write St. Joseph underneath. Won't help. Next. St. Uh, Anthony of Padua took a vow of chastity. What's there? The lily. So when you see the white lily, think purity, chastity, virginity. That's your cue. Okay, uh, next. Now, this is a painting uh, from, let's see, third, uh, I just want to get, uh, this is Frau Angelica from 1425, okay, so about 600 years ago now. And in this painting, there are some interesting things. First of all, it's entitled, if you knew, if you couldn't read, if you could read, is St. Peter Teaching St. Mark. Well, you can tell right away who St. Peter and St. Mark are. They have halos. Did the other people have halos? No halos. They're common people. They're me. They're Tom Joseph in the crowd there. All right? Now, Peter is doing the preaching. What's the other gentleman doing? He's St. Mark. So how do we know he's St. Mark and not St. Andrew? He's writing. And what did St. Mark do? He's one of the authors of the gospel, Mark's gospel. So this is your cue to understand that he's a gospel writer, okay? Sometimes, since you couldn't put the name, that's how the uh, gospel writers got symbols. You couldn't put St. Mark, so he was symbolized by the lion. You couldn't put St. Luke, so he was symbolized by the cow. You couldn't write St. John. He's the eagle. You couldn't write St. Matthew. He was an angel. And those are the four Gospels, and always consistently, that's the icon for each of those Gospel writers. Okay, another thing of interest here, and this is what they did in the Middle Ages, you might not catch it without it being told, but St. Peter and St. Mark are wearing first century Palestinian clothes. The people in the crowd are not. They're wearing 14th century European clothes. You or I might not catch it, but if I had this painting and Mark and, P and Peter were in that, those clothes and there were guys there with suit and ties, women with dresses, teenagers with hoodies and uh, uh, jeans, you'd say, wait a minute. Why was this done? It was done in order for the people to feel that they were part and parcel of the life of the church, of the life and mission of the church. And so you often uh, will see that. Next picture. Next. Aha. This is a favorite of mine. Uh, it is of the presentation of the Lord in the temple, February 2nd, 40 days after uh, Christmas. And we have the principles here. I'm sorry, I don't know. We have Mary, the elderly Joseph. The tradition came, and Joseph is always showed older than Mary, although the gospel doesn't give us his age. He's older than Mary. How do we assume that? He died before her. We, after Jesus is found in the temple, we never hear of Joseph again. It's assumed he died. Mary, we know, continues. Therefore, she's younger, is what we say. There's Simeon, who was the priest who was promised that he would not die until he saw the Lord. Anna the widow who was always in the temple. But who are these other people? There's a man, a younger man, and two young gir girls. He's the one who paid for the painting. 
okay? You can't put underneath gift of Mr. and Mrs. Smith if people can't read. So what did they do? They painted themselves in. The man with the red turban is the one who paid for it. The gentleman aside of him is his son. The other two are identified as his two daughters. Where his wife is, I don't know. Could be dead, she could be a widow. Uh, they might have had a fight and he said, you're not getting in my painting. Or uh, she had a bad hair day. I don't know, she's not there. Uh, now, <clears throat> why would they do that? Well, they did it for two, aside from they couldn't write it, was one, there was some grandstanding. You know, look at me, I gave this big contribution to have this painting so you can have this in, in your church. I'm a big wheel, you owe me. It's pride. The other reason was, since they couldn't read it was a gift of someone, they were very concerned about their souls. And it was felt that if whoever was in there meditating on the mystery of the picture while praying would also be reminded to pay, pray for the soul of the person who sponsored the painting, okay? So there were a couple of reasons why they wanted to begin into it. Okay, <clears throat> next. All right. Now, I got to back up just a little bit. The Sistine Chapel is older than St. Peter's. I mean, not the first St. Peter's, but the one that we're familiar with now. It was commissioned by Pope Sixtus IV in uh, 1473, and this is the chapel in which the cardinals go when they elect a pope and the white smoke goes up through the furnace uh, when the ballots are done. Well, the Sistine Chapel was not decorated much, and so Pope Julian II uh, commissioned uh, Michelangelo. Michelangelo was born in uh, 1475, and he lived through 1540, uh, 1564. So he was almost 90 years old when he passed away, which was a nice, long uh, life. And uh, Michelangelo, uh, Actually, his birthday's coming up March 6th, so if you don't know what to celebrate, that's his birthday, March 6th. Uh, so Michelangelo was commissioned by Pope Julius II to do the ceiling, and that's the one we uh, are most familiar with. He was in his 40s when he did that, and, the, and he was commissioned to do the creation, Genesis stories. In fact, the one I read this morning from Genesis about the tree and the apple, or not the apple, the fruit, that's on the ceiling. The most famous one is where God, the Father, is touching, almost touching Adam's finger, and that's in the middle, okay? Then, uh, it brings this up. Later, uh, when Michelangelo was 60, uh, Pope Paul III asked him to do on the front wall, a uh, end of the world, the last judgment type of thing. And that's what this is. You'll notice there are three tiers. There's Jesus coming in glory, uh, and the top tier are the people in heaven. The central tier are those in purgatory. The lower tier are those in hell. And he mixes Christian and mythical figures. For here, this is Karen, the boatman, who takes you across the river Styx. That's pagan, okay? This gentleman over here is uh, called Minos. He is the judge of the dead. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, get to that in a uh, second then. Okay, next. This is one of the purgatory shots, 
And this is of interest, and I tell it to you. This is the skin of St. Bartholomew. St. Bartholomew was one of the uh, uh, initial disciples of Jesus. In Persia, he was skinned to death. So his skin is here. I'll get to a story later, but uh, basically Michelangelo took a vow not to sign his paintings. However, what he did was he painted his own face in on the skin of, uh, so that's his signature on this. Okay, next. Aha. Now we're in hell. This is an interesting story. Here's the, the altar. There was nothing behind here. This is the altar. See this person here? He's Minos, the judge of the dead. And his picture is blown up here. Now here's the story. Michelangelo painted the, uh, uh, the piece and was happy with it. Well, there was a cardinal by the name of Blasio de Senza. And Palacio de Senza was the uh, master of ceremonies for the uh, Pope and keeper of the papal household. Well, he was very offended that there were so many nudes in this picture. So uh, he went to Pope Paul III and said to him, you got to do something about this. This is scandalous. Have Michelangelo paint... Uh, clothes on them. Well, Michelangelo, Michelangelo's artistic sensibilities were uh, offended, shall we say. And so what he did was he took Minos and painted the face of Cardinal de Senza, putting him in hell on the judge of the dead. Well, with that, de Senza go goes ballistic he goes to Paul III and says, look, this is unacceptable. I'm sure he said more than that to the Pope. And the Pope either didn't like to send so much, or he had a very interesting sense of humor because what he told the Sensa was, he said, oh, Eminence and Varsi, who did the uh, histories of the artists, relates the story. He said, Eminence, he said, had Michelangelo put you in purgatory, I would have had masses said night and day for you to get out. But since he put you in hell, even a pope can do nothing about that. So to this day, if you go there, you look, Cardinal de Senza's face is still on Minos. And that's probably his greatest claim to fame. Michelangelo made him famous, and I think if it were left to his own devices, he never would would have been. Okay, next. Aha, you know this one. This is the Pieta, one of many Pietas. It's not the only Pieta. Pieta means compassion, pity, and this is done by Michelangelo out of Carrara marble. He was 23 years old, and it took him a year to do this. Uh, this was from uh, 1498 to 1499. So he does this beautiful thing, and Varsi also gives us this story, was he would come back to uh, when the crowds came in to look at his work. He would stand in the crowd so he could listen to their comments. Was this good? Did they like it? Did they not? This, that, and the other thing. So he's standing in the crowd, and these two gentlemen are talking, and, one, and they're both praising this. This is the best thing since sliced bread. The man's a genius, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, of course, uh, uh, Michelangelo's feeling very good. Why wouldn't he? And uh, then the one guy says, Who did it? And the other guy says, Oh, it's Sculpture A. Well, that wasn't Michelangelo's name. And the other guy says, Oh, no, no, it's not him. It's Sculpture B. Now, Michelangelo, he's Italian, both sides. He gets angry, his pride is offended, and uh, so what he does, next, next, he comes back that night, and by candlelight, 
across the belt or the band, across the virgin breast, he writes, chisel, chisels in, Michelangelo's Bonaratis Eum Fecit, which in Latin means Michelangelo Bonarati made it. So he signed it. So if you go, you'll be able, if you know what you're looking for, because you can miss it, Michelangelo signed. Well, he got so upset with himself because of his pride that he swore that he would never sign another piece of his art, and he never did. The closest thing was he put his face in St. Bartholomew's skin on the Last Judgment. This is out of Carrara Marble. You can see it. You go into the St. Peter's. If you've never been there, there's a, entrant, a sort of a, a gathering space. You go through the next doors. You turn to the right, and it's right there. It has a bulletproof thing in front of it. The other statues don't. As you'll recall, 1972, if you're old enough, a crazed Hungarian man, Laszlo Tato, his name was, came in with a hammer and smashed up, knocked the nose right off the Pieta. They got it back together, and a couple times I visited. Since then, I look, and the nose is beautiful. I can't see anything. Okay. Okay, next. Ah, now, here's, let's get back to some iconography. The symbol for a martyr saint is the palm branch. So if somebody gave their life, they get the palm branch, okay? Like the lily was chastity, the palm branch was your martyr. Usually with the picture, again, they couldn't do names, they would show the palm branch and either instrument of their torture or death. Okay, this one just shows the palm branch, but it also tells us what? She's a virgin. So this is a virgin martyr. You got to be able to read it. Holy person, halo. It doesn't have the instrument of her death, but the artist signed this as to who it is. Who is it? The name is right there. What's the Latin word for lamb, L-A-M-B? Agnus, Agnus Dei, Lamb of God. Saint Agnes. Agnus is the is the, for St. Agnes. The name Agnes means lamb. So basically, it's been signed. This is St. Agnes. Next. Aha. Palm branch, halo. Oh, the long hair down also means a maiden or a virgin. If we would go back to St. Uh, Agnes, she had long hair. That's another sign. Who's this? See the long hair? Long hair? Who's this? Saint who? Somebody said it. Lucy. How do we know? Her eyes are on a plate. That's her sign, the sign of her torture and death. So she's one of the virgin martyrs too. There were five Latin virgin martyrs. There's Agnes, who we saw, Lucy, Agatha, Anastasia, and uh, someone dear to uh, Jacqueline's heart, Cecilia. Justine's heart, rather, Cecilia. Okay, patroness of music. Next. This is St. Catherine of Alexandria. The faithful would know this because her, of her method of death. Halo, she was tortured on the wheel, long hair, she was a virgin, she was then decapitated. The whole story is here if you can read the symbols. Next. Ah, 
This is an icon, a very poor one, I might add. I don't, I don't think it's so nice. But again, who is this? Well, the name is up there written, but if you didn't know and you could read the symbols, you would say, it's a martyr, Christian martyr. That's her tooth in a pliers. She was tortured by having her teeth extracted. Then she was burned. The flames are down here. That's St. Apollonia, the patron saint of dentistry. So next time you get a, a toothache, this is your girl, St. Apollonia. Okay, next. Aha, who is this? Now, you should be able to tell me by looking at the symbols, who do you think that is? And it's not Tom Joseph, despite the halo. Who is it? Peter. A lot of symbols here, a lot of symbols. First of all, the keys. You are Peter, and upon this rock I build my church, and I give you the keys to the kingdom. Anytime you see a saint holding the keys, bet the house it's Peter, you'll be right. All right? What else do we have? We know he's a martyr. In 64, he was crucified on Vatican Hill. We know he was Bishop of Rome, and that's why he's wearing the Pella. Also, in case you're really stupid, they put the Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica, back there in the back. Now, that's what we call an anachronism. An anachronism is something that couldn't possibly be there, but the artist does it because he doesn't trust your abilities, basically. Uh, what's in a, okay, so uh, St. Peter's, that St. Peter's Basilica wasn't started until 1509, ended in 1628. So obviously Peter wasn't there, nor did bishops in the first century wear the Pella around their neck. Uh, but the other symbols are there for Peter. Next. Ah, oh, what's this? Now, everybody should tell me what this is. It's not hard. This is not rocket science. What is that? An angel. Great. Perfect. That wasn't hard. And how would you know it was an angel? Wings and the halo. So it's not a bat. It's not... <clears throat> Why in art did they give angels wings? What's the, what's the function of angels, mostly in scripture? I'm sorry? They can fly. Now, why do they need to fly? Okay. Angels serve God, and the way we hear about them most of the time is they bring messages to people. And how's the fastest way to get from God the Father to Tom Joseph? Fly. fly. You got it. I'm telling you. Pro <laughs> okay, fly. Right? Okay. So that's, uh, that's why uh, they do. And, and the fact that they bring messages, just think of the Christmas story. An angel announces to Mary, God wants you to be the mother of God, the mother of a son, message. Joseph decides he's going to what? Divorce her? Angel appears. Don't do it. She's not what you think. They go down to Bethlehem. They have the baby. God the Father wants the word to get out. What does he do? He appears to the shepherds. How? Angels right? Then uh, what happens? The wise men come. They're told, don't go back the same way. Herod wants to kill the baby. How do they know not to go back? An angel appears to them in the dream. And then when uh, uh, Herod goes to kill the babies and Joseph is told to take the mother and, and baby to Egypt, how does he know? An angel. So angels bring messages, and that's why they need wings. That's how, that's the iconography. Now, this is not limited to Christian iconography. 
Even the Greco-Roman pagans use that. Hermes or Mercury was the messenger of the gods. And if you look at any statues of Hermes or Mercury, they have wings either on their heels or on the helmet. And so it's not only Christian iconography, but other iconography. Next. Ah, this is a quickie. It's the baptism of the Lord, John the Baptist, Jesus. And what's that bird doing up there? Who's the bird? What's the bird? Who? Holy Spirit descended like a dove over Jesus. So, this, what happened was it's hard to paint a spirit. So what they did was they used that symbol. When you see the dove, it's the Holy Spirit. Even in paintings where a dove doesn't appear, the Annunciation, it says she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, they didn't say he looked like a dove. At Pentecost, it said tongues of fire. He didn't look like a dove. But yet, when you look at those paintings, they're still there. All right? The three symbols for Holy Spirit is dove, fire, and wind. But it's hard to paint wind, but you can paint the effects of wind. You should know. My grandson, number two, by three minutes. Okay, next. Uh, we're almost at the end. Uh, this is an annunciation. Now look, let's, let's pick this apart to read the symbols. On this side is who? Who's this? Mary. She has a crown, a halo. She's holy. She's a virgin, the lily. On this side is the dove. She was overcome by the Holy Spirit, conceived by the Holy Spirit, right? So another piece here is a piece of theology. What's she wearing? Blue is the color of humanity. Red is the color of divinity. In her humanity, the blue cloak, she carries our Lord who is divine in her womb. That's why she's wearing blue and red. Let's go to the panel on the right. Who's, what's that with the wings? We were, an angel, right? And angels bring messages, and just to make sure you see that, he's carrying a staff with Ave Maria, Hail Mary. Up in the corner, who, who orchestrated this whole thing? God the Father. And he's looking over. He's up in the right-hand corner looking over the whole thing. So you get the whole story looking at one shot. Now, here's something interesting. What's that partition in the middle for? Who would ruin a good painting? I wouldn't do that by putting a wall right in the middle. It's got to be telling you something. Hmm? No, heaven and earth, no. What it's telling you is that Mary was conceived not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit. So at the time of her conception, who's the only one on her side of the panel? The Holy Spirit. And to show that nobody else was there, is there. And you can look at a lot of, this was, 1470, if you look at a 1450 Frau Angelica um, Annunciation at uh, St. Marco, there's a pillar in the middle, a stone column or a pillar, okay? I saw a recent one, I could, should have put it up here. I said that the Holy Spirit can be shown as wind. There's an Annunciation, modern one, Mary, the angel, an open window, and, what, and I said you can't paint wind, but you can paint its effects. And there are drapes on the window, curtains, that are being blown in, so you know wind is there. And not only that, but the curtains are where between Mary 
and anything else. So it's here 600 years the partition has been there. Next. Okay. Next. We're at the end. Next. Ah. This is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, Christian iconograph. What is it? What's that? Yeah, you. What's that? What does it look like? A fish. No rocket science there. A fish. Next. Now, the fish in Greek is pronounced ichthos. So when anyone would see it who was knowledgeable, they'd say ichthos. Ichthos means fish. Now, that's what we would call, I want to get the word right, an acronym. That's an acronym. Now, what's another acronym? Okay, if I ask my grandmother, what does pin mean? She would say, oh, what do you mean? It's a sharp thing, looks like a needle, used to hold uh, uh, cloth together when you're sewing it. If I ask somebody in the last 25 years what PIN is, there's a good chance they'd say personal identification number. We call it PIN. That's an acronym. ICTHOS is an acronym. Anyone who wasn't in the in crowd, who didn't know computers, if you will, at the time, would say fish, no problem. But to the Christian, the Greek letters Iota, Chi, Theta, Upsilon, Sigma, which pronounced ichthos, is Isus, Christos, Theui, Usas, Sotar, which means Jesus Christ, God, Son, and Savior. So it was sort of a Christian code. This may actually have been older than the cross as a Christian iconography, as a symbol. That's about it. I went well over my time. I'm sorry about that. If anyone has any questions, ask. If I can answer them, I will. And anyone who wishes to leave because they're too hungry, please do. Thank you. Are there any questions?